All right, Tony, welcome to the Atlantic Records interview disc series. Let's trace the steps that led to the forming of Bank Statement, okay? The uh, the Genesis tour for Invisible Touch ended, what, 1987? Uh, yeah, yes it did. Okay, um, and then what did you do, take a holiday or something? I took some time off, yes. Uh, it was actually, wasn't it 86, was it ended? Was it 87? It was 87, that's right, yes, you're absolutely right. Anyhow, I took some time off. I only meant to take really a month or two off, and then I was I had a film possibility that I was going to do. But in... It was a kind of, the film wasn't, it was a bit of a nature film, really, so I wasn't that excited about doing it, but it was something that I thought would be quite fun to do. It wasn't going to be a great career advancement, but it was sort of, sort of, sort of thing to sort of do, and I thought quite fancy the idea. And I just decided I always wanted to do another, at least another attempt at a, at a record of my songs, you know. I wasn't quite sure. I'd always thought that perhaps I would like to do one that um, involved other singers on it, you know. I'd worked, obviously, in recent years with two or three other singers, and I found it quite a pleasurable experience. Uh, so in one way of making it different from the previous solo record, as far as I was concerned, was to use other singers. So I had to sort of look around to, to find people. When did you formally sit down and get together these songs for this project? Well, probably during that sort of the summer, last summer. Um, you know, you kind of, some songs, I mean, I knew I had lots of gaps and I also wanted to do more contemporary writing, you know. Because I tend to write songs all the time, but then a lot of them I kind of... I get bored of or else I forget them, you know, kind of, and then move on to the next one, you know. I've always got a, a pool of songs, and I can't keep that many in my brain at one time, and you know what it's like. You, and it, it, what it is when you decide you're making an album, it's a bit like sort of musical chairs, it's just kind of the ones that end up on the chairs tend to be the ones that you consider, you know. Right. So I had about, um, I shortlisted what, I've got 11 tracks on the CD, 10 on the, on the album, and um, I probably had about, I did demos of about 18 tracks, I think. And um, and then once I decided, you know, I went through, I listened, played stuff to, you know, Tony Smith and also to Jeremy LaSalle's at Virgin Records in England. And um, and later on also to Steve Hillich, who co-produced this record with me. And we kind of made, I mean, I had certain songs, key songs I knew were going to be on it and other songs that I wasn't so sure about, you know. And so we made kind of shortlisted you know, decisions about that and actually ended up recording 11 songs. Well, in fact, there were, of the original 18, there were 10 and I added one more that I wrote sort of during the making of the album, which I actually did. And there was one song as well, another song, which was uh, is a, a vocal version. The song Queen of Darkness is a vocal version of an instrumental track I, in fact, did on my soundtracks LP. Uh, it was a piece of music I'd always had earmarked as a possible song uh, if that film had done a bit better, but the film, the film that it came from was an irrelevant film. And, in fact, it was Steve... Hillage, when he was listening to my old stuff, he came across that piece and thought it would make a really good song. And I, as I said, I'd always thought about it, but he kind of like was so enthusiastic about the idea that I thought, well, I'll, I'll definitely give it a go, you know. That's good. And uh, so it was fun. How did you go about, how and when did you go about assembling the musicians that you used on the record? I mean, did you write the songs first? You had all those songs, and then you said, okay, I'd like to have this person, you know, sing this, or I'd like to have this drummer. Well, I hadn't, I didn't write any lyrics. Um, at, the, at the stage when I was choosing people and everything. I mean, once I decided, the first thing I had to decide on was whether I was going to, you know, again, the, having decided I wasn't going to sing. Um, and then I decided that there was slight pressure on me from record companies and things to perhaps go for a co-producer. So once I decided on that, I uh, then worked with Steve Hillage. We, we sort of thought about what musicians, you know, and I particularly, well, certain people I came up with. I mean, Pino Palladino, who's the bass player on most of the record, he was someone I'd seen playing with Paul Young, He's a great bass player, and I mean, I didn't realise actually how many records he'd played on, you know, cause, but I just particularly liked him with Paul Young, I thought he was really good. So I, I always wanted to use him, and then, you know, we listened to loads of uh, tapes of the vocalists, that was obviously the big, the big problem. And, um, I mean, I, we, I, I'd always wanted to use a girl singer on the record, I mean, I'd worked a few years ago with Toya in England, and I found that a really good experience, you know, produced a song, one, which I consider to be one of the best songs I've, I've ever done, you know. Anyhow, so I wanted to work with a girl, and so I listened to loads of people. The girl singing, in fact, was very easy. This this girl, she sings with the, uh, Janie Climax. She sings with a German-based group called The Other Ones, who've had a you know certain amount of success around the place. I mean, not a massive band, obviously, but some success. And I think she was my first choice. You know, having listened to all the the, the potential, you know, people I sort of had to choose from, and we rang her up, and she was keen on it. Had a bit more trouble finding the right male singer. Um, I listened to quite a few people early on, and then had a few, you know, one or two people I contacted, and it didn't sort of work out for whatever reason. Um, and later on in the in the project, I came across Alistair Gordon's voice. He had a tape. He coincidentally happens to be an Atlantic uh, singer-songwriter, you know. And I, I nothing 
this was pure coincidence, but I was just given the tape and I thought they had a really good voice. And uh, so I, I was very keen on, on using him. And again, I rang him up, said, are you interested? And he said, yeah. No. Steve Hillage, who co-produces the record, also plays guitar as That's well. That's right. Do you want to go and, and explain like how you guys go back? Do you, you know? I don't go back anywhere with him actually at all. I, I'd not. Um, I was. I mean, I'm not. I never have been really since the '60s when I would listen to music all the time. I've never been a great uh, listener to rock music, contemporary rock music at all. And I must admit, all Steve's career totally passed me by. I'd never heard anything by him. I knew him as a man in a woolly hat, who kind of like you know. You know, and I assumed, I kind of assumed what music you play without ever hearing it, which is probably what most people assume about my records, which is the problem you have, you know. But anyhow, um, I came across, once I, someone said to me, once I decided I was going to have a co-producer, I listened to a series of potential people, and I listened to his his tape I just liked. I thought it was no no conflicts there. I thought, I thought the way he made music sound was the way I liked music to sound, and I wouldn't argue with him, you know. And um, he came fairly highly recommended from Virgin as well as a producer. And these days he thinks of himself as a producer and not as a guitarist. And it was difficult to get him to play much guitar on this record. Most of the, what you hear as guitar on the record is actually keyboards. The, there's only really one bit of guitar that stands out on the record that Steve plays, which is on the end of the song called Rain Cloud, which he does a little solo on. Um, the rest of the album is the various guitar sounds come in and out, but they're really keyboards, you know. So, so, so then uh, the beginning of A House Needs a Roof is not a guitar? No, there? that's that's keyboard. Wow, yeah. he's really getting good at that stuff. <laughs> well, it's, you know, it, the, the, I mean, he, at one point we thought, well, shall we get him to sort of play it, you know, or double it or anything, but it just it just didn't... That particular song is a very sort of um, kind of machine sort of song, and it sort of seemed to suit it to keep it with a sort of more rigid sound. Of the, uh, you know something, it, I was totally fooled. I thought that was yeah, a guitar right. there. Well, yeah, I, I thought of, you know, crediting, putting sort of more detailed credits on the album so that people would know. In fact, it was all me and not Steve, you know. <laughs> but apart from on one track, the only track I did write it on was on um, a big band where, where the sort of the guitar, this is kind of like a sort of picking kind of guitar thing, which is, well, it's, it's such a prominent part of the song. I thought, you know, it would be wrong if people thought that was Steve really in a way. I mean, I, uh, you know, mm -hmm. it matters that much. Well, let's talk about uh, the songs on the record now. Throwback is, a, is a, about a very interesting character. Do you think that perhaps the times we live in now um, are becoming too rigid to allow for individuality? I mean, well, in a sense, that's, I suppose, is to some extent what the song's about. You know, um, it's very specifically about a person who, 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 an individual who feels himself totally unable to cope with, with the modern, modern time, if you like, and he really doesn't understand why people behave the way they do and doesn't understand why they obey the laws that they do and, and allow themselves to be sort of like, to be directed, if you like, by sort of inanimate things and all the rest of it, and, as well as people. Um, I, I think this is a kind of extreme sort of viewpoint of, of what perhaps a lot of people feel a bit at uh, various times. I mean, you know, I mean, certainly everybody knows that moment when they're at a party or something and, uh, you know, they wonder what the hell they're doing there, that sort of thing, and that's a very minor example of it. And every, there are always more major things when you really don't feel that a particular law you really want to obey, you know, that right. kind of thing. I think different people feel it to varying degrees. I don't, think, I don't know if anybody feels quite as alienated as this particular character does. I hope he doesn't, you know. No, he's a throwback. Yeah, that's right. And I, and I also, I, mean, I made it a little bit more, I added a side element of humour with it, as well as taking that, what I say is the real meaning of the song, but coming back a little bit to, to, to the sort of more literal meaning of a throwback and sort of comparing him to kind of a werewolf, you know, and things like that. And it, so that he doesn't need moonlight in order to sort of change into what he is all the time and that kind of thing, you know. The next song I'll be waiting, the character in this song is so sad. Poor chap. Yeah. yeah. I tend to write, my songs are either sort of, they're always a bit dark and depressing and sad. I tend to find that more fun to write songs like that. <laughs> I don't know what it is, something about minor keys and everything. And every time I write, if I write about sort of love, you know, <laughs> I always write about it sort of when it's going wrong. Because I think it just produces a better song, you know. I, I don't know, I'm not very into sort of, um, you know, I'm happy, everything's fantastic kind of songs, you know, sort of dance type songs and things, which are a lot of those sort of things. I don't get into that. I like, I like a moody sort of song. And um, in fact, I've got three ballads on this album, and they're all sort of essentially sort of love gone wrong type songs. Right. This character I see is a very easy person, to, very easy for virtually any male to identify. At some point in his life, he's felt like this: there's some woman that he's he desires, who he knows he can never have. You know, I mean. Uh, he, but I he's think, he's telling himself, if I if I had been born bolder. Yes, he could do something about it. Well, obviously, this is you know, is, I mean. Uh, I mean, this is how certainly, I mean, I don't know whether you've felt like this, but I think a lot of people do feel that if you could just do a bit more about it, I mean, if you, you've had the guts, you know, because it's so often, you know, 
I mean, in many cases, the girl is going through the same thing as, as the boy is in this situation, you know, and he's, she's just waiting for something like that, and, uh, but he can't do anything about it, you know, you, you just feel you cannot do it, you know, you can't go up and say, I think you're beautiful, please do something, you know, <laughs> and it, it just, you know, I think particularly as a sort of teenager, you go through this sort of like, you know, twice a day, and then perhaps a sort of bit less later in life, you know. On Queen of Darkness, now my first reaction to this song was that it's sort of reminiscent of the Genesis sound, which obviously, yeah. mm. you know, you part of that band you're so instrumental in creating that sound is the character in this song so evil that she can create the illusion of being both good and bad or or is it well I sort of started off with the idea of writing this song because you see when I knew I didn't write this lyric until I knew that Janie was, was singing on this record ah. what you have in Janie you have a sort of extrovert an attractive girl and I thought this would be quite nice to have her sort of singing kind of like almost a fantasy kind of thing so she could sort of you know, so I, as a male, write a lyric for her, and she says to me, I, "You know, if you want me to, I can be this, this, that, or the other. You know, any fantasy you desire, I can become." You know, but I kind of uh, modified it a bit, and she became sort of more kind of yes, as you said, a sort of like evil, some evil aspects to her, and some sort of good aspects. She, she can be anything you want, was the whole idea of it. Um, but I had to put the little proviso in the song, so most of the song is sung how a man wants a woman to sing. But there's one little bit where she goes, "Leave me alone." which is the one little line I put in, which was what the woman would actually say. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, you found it interesting trying to write that from a woman's point yeah, of view. Yeah, well, it's quite fun, you know, it's sort of, uh, you know, from a woman's point of view, but really writing as a man still, you know, right. that was quite an interesting sort of uh, thing to do. The instrumental part was originally written for a film, a film called Locker and the Outlaws, and it ended up on, on the album soundtracks. And, uh, you know, the, on the album it was done very much as a sort of piece of incidental music, so it didn't have the shape, you know, so I took out two or three elements from that, that and then made a song out of it for, for, for this, which I think I liked. It does bear some relationship to sort of songs like Abacab that we've done in the past, I suppose, you know. That night. Is this song uh, like about down there which we dare not speak lest we go blind, you know what I mean? <laughs> <It's>, uh... <laughs> this is a song about infidelity, really. <laughs> It doesn't apply to me personally, I promise you, boys and girls, it really doesn't. It, it, but it's an easy enough thing to sort of know how people feel, and you can see other people going through these things all the time. And it, it's this point, you know, when you have to, you know, at some point, somebody, you have got to make a choice, you know. Um, I've seen friends, you know, who don't want to make a choice, and they may have to, they're forced into a choice as to which woman they go with, you know. And it's not totally clear in this which, which woman he ends up with, although I presume he ends going up going with a new woman. Um... I see it as a sort of seductress, really. I mean, I suppose she's drawing him him away from the situation that he kind of, in a sense, is happy to be in. But this other woman has kind of drawn him out of that situation. And Seems to be struggling against it mightily, too. Yes, that's it, because you've got the sort of the magnet thing. It's the fact that I feel the person has no choice. And I think that's, you do see this sometimes. Some people think that they have, that you really, it comes a certain point in this kind of business. You know, once you've let yourself go a certain distance, you've really got no choice. It's going to, uh, you're going to end up going the whole way, really. Mm -hmm. It's the sort of thing you can't play around in. I like the idea because again, having a male and a female singer on the on the record, I thought it would be nice to have a song where they're both singing together, and a song which really reflected the fact that they were a man and a woman. You know, so many, but not just a straightforward. You know, I think you're beautiful. I think you're beautiful too. Type <laughs> song. You know, which is sort of like what these things often are. I thought it'd just be fun to have a something which was sort of like represented the sort of triangle situation, and you know, and. That's sort of a, what is a, one of the commonest problems, you know, in sort of marriages and everything. Sure. Uh, and to make the most of it, really. Now, Rain Cloud, uh, the song is about hope, right? Yep, it's an optimistic song. It's about the only optimistic song on the record, I suppose. So the person starts in a dark situation and ends up in a happier one. It's a very simple concept. This. I, I like to think of it as a kind of like a little cartoon, you know. You know those kind of... Um, Situations when you've got a you've got a cartoon, you've got a bright sunny day, and everyone's playing, building sandcastles and rest. But you've got one little guy sitting down somewhere. He's got a little dark cloud above his head. So it's his, this is the rain cloud that's sitting above his head. And so and all I'm doing is like the wind. You know, sometimes you get the wind sort of pictured in the same picture, and he's just blowing the the cloud off his head, so he feels all right. Yeah. The idea being always, I mean, a very simple idea, but it, it, you can't say it enough times, I suppose, really, that when you're feeling depressed. That the chances are tomorrow you won't feel as depressed and you know, whatever seems so bad at one point very often doesn't seem so bad the next day it's just like my friend so it's a song of optimism yeah it's like a friend of mine says don't worry uh, it always looks graced just before it turns totally black yeah. um, <laughs> that's the other approach of course but as I said I'm being optimistic on this one track you know and, uh, unusual but yes uh, unusual it's, it's the one one contrast on the record yeah. yeah the percussion on this has a very nice feel to it as well yeah well this was something I uh, originally wrote the first thing I had of this song, and I, this is the oldest song on the record, it's been around a long time, um, was just a little drum machine thing I had, which is what you sort of hear at the beginning of the song. I think, I can't remember, no, we don't start at the beginning anymore, but anyhow, it's there all the way through. It's just a little conga part. Um, 
tom tom part it was on a on a sort of old old drum machine and it had a great rhythm and so i then added real congas to the record you know to give it a more of a sort of feel i think it's i think it works well the only th- thing about this record is the one that one thing where i think alice had a bit of a struggle with this song he always find it very difficult and it's possible that the it's the one song that suits his voice least well and it could have done with it almost wants a sort of like a black kind of voice, you know. Something it should have been a little freer. The whole thing it was wasn't supposed to be quite so rigid as it ended up. I think it's turned out good, but yeah. it didn't turn out perhaps quite as well as as I originally thought that it. You know, as I could see it, I could hear it in my mind. You know, because for you know for all the other songs, I think Alice's voice works so well. You know, but that's always the same. It's like when when Phil when you're writing songs with him or something. There's some songs that you know obviously work better than others. Yeah. Well, you see, you're stepping outside of this, you know, li- liking to write these dark songs here. So yes, it's I know, a good, that's it. good step there. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe, maybe it'll set a trend for me. I don't know. Sort of like 99 dark songs and one optimistic <laughs> song. <laughs> the Border. Now, this uh, song opens with this that keyboard. It's it just got that great feel of like this wide-eyed, open wonderment, you know, almost yeah. like you can see yourself floating above the clouds mm. to this. Well, it'd be a great sort of, you know, it'd be a fantastic sort of opening to kind of like a you know, Panavision sort of Technicolor sort of film or something, you know, right. sort of like desert scenes and things. Um, I'll never get that chance, you know. <laughs> make a great video, but it would cost about a million pounds to make. You That's know, all. So. <laughs> <laughs> what the? But uh, this is probably the most ambitious track in in lyrical, well, and musically and lyrically in many ways. Although musically, I, I did restrain myself a bit on this. I have got a version of this song that goes on for about sort of 12, 15 minutes, but really? I decided on the record that I would sort of keep it keep it well down. And because uh, I wanted to get as much variety on the record as possible, and to emphasise songs rather than instrumental parts, since I do a lot of instrumental work with the films, you know, since the rest of the stuff was mainly instrumental. But you've got here. This is just a discussion. I mean, just a, a little, a little dramatic scene, if you like, taking place concerning the, this border. I've always. I mean, I think because you, when you're born in England, or at least Britain, as it were, um, you have no borders on the island. You know, Great Britain. Uh, so. You, you, the first time you go, you go anywhere. You always go on a boat or a plane, you know. So you have a very definite idea that when you go into a foreign country. And the first time I went, went to sort of France and then went to Belgium and Germany and things, and you realise you just suddenly cross this very arbitrary point in the ground, you know, is suddenly the border. And I thought, you know, I've always been fascinated by borders for that reason. I think that at some point suddenly, you know, the rules change, everything's different, language changes, and all that. And I'm even more um, find it even more difficult to understand some of these arbitrary borders that have been drawn. Particularly in Africa, they were done sort of during colonial times. They split them up and they just drew a line on the map, you know, followed a parallel or something. That's it. And yet, of course, these now have been inherited by sort of, um, you know, the current governments of these countries, and then they're defended to the hilt in many cases because there's all sorts of aspects to the mineral rights and stuff like that. You know, there are examples, particularly like between uh, Libya and Chad. There's a, stri- a very straight boundary there, and they've been fighting over that boundary for a long time. I just wonder, in a place like that and other places of similar kind, what there is there. I mean. Do you go there? I mean, is there a line? Is there is there something you can see? Is there a is there a wire? You know, is there a fence? Is yeah. there a wall? Yeah. And my impression is there's probably nothing there at all. There's probably not even a city. And you just look around. There's nothing at all. And yet people will kind of live or die to to defend this. You know, uh, I'm sure this happened in the Middle East all the time and things. I'm sure if you actually saw some of these borders there, like Iran Iraq borders, there's probably nothing there at all. They're fighting over. You know, and it's. Uh, I just find it a fascinating thing, you know, so that's that's what it's all about. And within that, it becomes, I've taken it sort of quite far to sort of to being a sort of anti, I mean, I, I'm always writing sort of generally anti-war in a general term, I suppose, song, you know, from that point of view. Big Man. Now, this this song here, is, uh, I think it shows a side of you that's not often appreciated. And I also think it's through the record, and that's your sense of humor there. Well, uh, tell us the story of the Big Man. Well... He's. I, I don't know what I started off writing him, and I. I see a person. You've got a person who's got to the top in his particular field who shouldn't be there. He got um, there because he got there for various reasons. He got there normally, probably by default. Right. You know, it's a bit like. I mean, you know, if you're talking about politics, it's a bit like if George Bush died tomorrow, you'd have Dan Quayle as president. Now, I, that may end up. Who knows? That might be a great thing. But Ooh. he hasn't got there because he was voted there. And the only reason he get there is by default. You know, and. Uh, I mean, it could be about that, or it could be... It's got definitely slightly more religious connotations about it. I think it could be someone who's got to the top of a sort of, um, you know, I mean, the old idea of sort of sacrifice and things, you know, get the sort of corrupt priest sort of thing, you know, it could be that. Or it could be something simpler like um, a schoolmaster, the sort of headmaster, you know, who gets there and he abuses it, his situation completely and sort of beats everybody all the time and all the rest of it. I see it as someone who's a real sort of like a little... 
you know, the sort of little demon sort of ended up at the top there. And he, he knows he's not got much time there. I and mean, while he's there, he's going to make the most of it, you know. Yeah. I think you get this. I mean, I'm sure you get this in situations, but it's sometimes not difficult, not too easy to know exactly where that's, you know, when and where. But it's. Uh, Unfortunately, when it happens to a person, it's one of the most horrible things, you know, yes. to happen. I mean, you get this guy in authority there that directly affects you all the time and he's exactly like, and he's he, just not the right person and there's not much you can do about it either and right you get it in books a lot of course you know in science fiction books you always have characters like this everywhere littered through them you know and i like those kind of books so it's uh but it's uh, anyhow it's a sort of fun thing because i actually sing obviously i sing this track right as well and so that i you know you can justify that a bit really because obviously it's the sort of alistair's kind of gone away and i've ended up singing you know so the guy shouldn't be there at all so i'm just going to have fun for this one song you know while no one's looking you know and uh, so it, that, it it justified it from that point of view but i sang it really chose to sing it because it's got the simplest melody and um you know my voice is kind of like i, I think i mean i'm a great believer that you can take anybody off the streets and make them sound good in a studio it really doesn't it, you can cheat so much in a studio and believe me i have to cheat to make my voice sound halfway decent in a studio you know and uh but everybody cheats even the good singers cheat in the studio you know so i don't take any longer to cheat than they do <laughs> but if i sang here now you know you'd, you'd soon say well, yeah, you cheated pretty good there. You know? <laughs> uh, do you enjoy singing, though? I mean, I enjoy lots of aspects. I find it very satisfying. I, when I did the Fugitive album, you know, I, I decided that I was going to sing. I thought once in my life I'm going to sing on a whole record and see what it's like. And I got really in, to enjoy it actually. And I found that um, I was also quite surprised that I could face listen to it because I assumed that that's the problem. You think well, you know everyone hates the sound of their own voice. I think uh, if you're not really a singer, and you you think you're going to hate it. And then I sort of found a way of doing it, you know, uh, of using a particular set of gimmicks and stuff, but a particular approach to singing that I thought sounded pretty good. And, um, and it certainly worked on a lot of the tracks on that record. I don't say it worked on them all, but it worked on lots of them. Do you ever find it difficult to, like, do you think you have to top yourself each time out? I mean, you've been, uh, it's been 21 years maybe that you've been doing music now, and you've had some terrific accomplishments all along the way. I mean,. I don't. I never kind of think about it like that. I'm always kind of into the most recent thing. You just write what you write, and you, you know. Obviously, it's nice if some things are getting better, but I don't think necessarily you can. You can't really. I mean, you've only got to look at classical composers. There's no way that they necessarily wrote their best music right at the end of their lives. Often, it was some wrote the best at the beginning, but it didn't mean that the stuff at the end wasn't still good. You know, I think you just write what you can at the time, the best you can, and you see where it kind of. Uh, and it's right for the time. I mean. I would hate to try and sort of at this point in time to try and put our you know Genesis albums or anything in a particular order of of merit. You know, I think it's impossible to do. My heart is always more towards the more recent stuff in many ways because it's sort of closer to, you know, because at the time you come to write the most recent album, you have a choice of doing what you like and what you end up doing is what is what you like at the time. You know, as opposed to you didn't end up doing an album that was like something you did in 1973, and this is, applies to Bank Statement just as much. I mean, for me, this is the thing I'm most into at the moment. You know. I'm sure next time we do a Genesis record, I'll be, that'll be the thing I'm most into. I, I live very much in a sort of present sort of situation, I think, with, with, with music, and I kind of my taste moves along. I hardly, you know, it's not like I even spend much time listening to old stuff, really. You know, I'm more interested in writing new stuff. Mm -hmm. Do you hope to be able to take um, this bank statement out on the road? I mean, do you, are the, the people that you've used on the record and stuff prepared to do that well the thing. singers as you can see really the emphasis on this is really a bank statement i look at really as me and plus the two singers you know i don't know they, they would love to do it really um my own attitude to it is is that i want to sort of see this album get get somewhere a little bit first and if it doesn't i would probably be inclined to 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 leave it right. i mean there's an awful lot of ways of approaching you know this this particular problem of trying to get my songs across so that people will actually give it a bit of a listen and um, this is just another approach, and if it doesn't work, then I'll try something else, I suppose. Mm -hmm. And there's always the films as well. I'd love to do this again. I, I really enjoyed working with it. I think Janie's got a fabulous voice, and, and you know, and Alistair too. And I think it would be nice to, particularly, uh, what I'd really like to do is another record, actually, in this lineup, quite quickly. Uh, because, you know, you get to know each other, and you can, the approach would be slightly different, you know. And it might be sort of a little more integrated, you know. Uh, which I would enjoy doing. Well, I want to wish you good luck with the record. Thank you. Uh, very well done, and uh, thanks for spending time today. Thanks very much.